So she like tried to put me in my place by like, didn't you kill a woman at your gathering? I'm just disgusted by women right now. I just wanna spit on them. I just wanna spit on women. I truly believe that what has happened over the last two years is the biggest crimes against humanity that humans have ever seen. Now you might be like, what about the Holocaust? And I think this is worse. I've been called crazy. I've been called a lot of things and I fully embrace that because it is true. Today's video is sponsored by Endel. If you're anything like me, it can often be difficult to focus on tasks. Or maybe you're stressing your anxiety, or if you're like me, you have ADHD and can't focus on anything. All of that can get in the way of the intentions that you set for yourself. Well, I am pleased to introduce you to Endel. So here it is. As you can tell, it's already playing some music here. Well, I don't even want to call it music. It's kind of more like soundscapes. It's an environment-based app that takes everything that we know about sound and it combines it with cutting-edge technology. And the result is real-time personalized soundscapes, like really personalized. It's really cool. I'll show you. And it's just designed to help you relax, focus, sleep. Literally any part of your day can be enhanced by using Endel. It's informed by science, created with science, and backed by science, and also backed by me and my own testimonial. Like I literally told my psychiatrist about this app. That's how much I love it. I was literally on a call with her last week just discussing my ADHD symptoms and all that stuff and like how everything's going. And I told her like, hey, I've been working so much on this video that you're watching right now. And I'm like, you know, what's really helped me is this app. Cause yeah, while I was researching this video, I was using Endel. So what does it do? Well, it's patented AI technology. And like I said, it doesn't play like music. It's just more ambient sounds and you can personalize it to do whatever you want to do. So right now I have it set to dynamic focus. I don't have to turn my screen around. I'll just put it on the screen here. See how like you can move, like if I want more of a mellow sound here, I'll hold this closer to my microphone so you can hear. Um, so it's more mellow here, but if I want it maybe more bright. See how it kind of adds a more of a bright feel to it, energetic adds a little bit more there. Maybe you want it spacey. So I just started a self-love regimen of mindfulness, tarot, and journaling. I just set Endel on the meditate mode for 45 minutes and it enhances the experience of this daily ritual of mine. Also, I utilize it while researching and scripting. It really helps me stay on task. I literally used to just put on a lo-fi playlist while working, but some of those songs can get distracting in the vibe can shift. And with Endel, it's just kind of like a constant sound and you can customize it yourself. But maybe you want to sleep. Sometimes we all want to sleep, don't we? I haven't used it for sleep before, but I can imagine that it's probably helpful for people who need a little help in the sleepy time department. You can set your alarm to it. You can set it to go all night. I mean, it's just, it's really neat. Another thing that I just recently discovered that you can do too, they have something called a clarity trip. So if you do this while you're hiking, it counts your steps, so watch that. Well, I mean, not hiking, just exercising, but watch this. See, it's counting my steps. It gets faster as I'm moving. And then if I stop. It slows down again. Power nap, reading, chores, airplane. Listen, I know this is probably going to end up being a long ad, but like I just am so in awe with this app. I really think that there's something for everyone with Endel, and I think you're gonna love it too. So, the first 100 people to download Endel by clicking the link in the description or scanning the QR code will get a free week of audio experiences. 
So make sure you're checking the description of this video. I'll also have it in a pinned comment. Try Endel, seriously. Whether you're doing chores or working or driving or apparently flying on an airplane or exercising or meditating or reading or writing or <laughs> being creative or in nature, taking a hike, and no matter what it is that you're doing, Endel can help with that. And honestly, I've just, I've never been so in love with a sponsor on this channel. I love Endel. Now we have to go talk about Angela Sumner. Let's go. We talk a lot about MLM distributors on this channel, but we often come across people who are like the personification of a train wreck or a car on fire or like some old guy streaking across a football field or something. You know <laughs> where I'm going with these analogies. They're just like so horrific that you don't want to look at them. You don't want to see them, but like at the same time, you can't look away. Angela Faith Sumner is one of those people. Often referred to simply as the Monate Witch, Angela is a distributor for, you guessed it, Monate, which is an extremely popular shampoo MLM. Scrolling through Angela's many, many, many <laughs> posts, I oddly found myself becoming invested in her, in her story, in her journey, in her whereabouts. Before Monet, I can honestly say that Angela, at least from what we can see on the internet, is a fascinating creature. And I mean that wholeheartedly and totally and completely honestly. She would use her Instagram account essentially like a journal, and I almost found myself becoming envious of her nomadic lifestyle. The freedom that this woman had to just get up and go wherever she wanted, whenever she wanted, was making me desire this for myself, even if just for a brief moment. If she wanted to sleep in the forest beneath the stars every night with her dog, she could. If she wanted to lay in a stream for three hours, she could do it. And there really is something beautiful about that. And yeah, admittedly, the captions on her posts were rambly, strange, and oftentimes concerning or disturbing but it seemed like she wasn't harming anybody. She was just living in every moment to the fullest extent. And I will say this, researching this video humanized Angela to me more than I've ever been able to humanize another MLM distributor before. If Angela was still who she was in 2016, I'd probably be following her today. She was authentic, carefree, and beautiful. The reality is though, she could only authentically keep this up for so long before her love for money took over what once appeared to be a gracious and unbound individual. How did she go from this to what she is now? How does one go from limitless, wild, and free to a controlling, manipulative person who joins a pyramid scheme. How could she go from spending about a month, maybe even more, protesting the construction of the Dakota Access Pipeline despite the freezing winter approaching, caring so much about the earth, the environment, human rights, and particularly women's rights, to being an ultra-right-wing conservative QAnon-believing nutjob? How can she go from making all of her money from thrifting and saying everything she owns is pre-owned to wearing Monate branded gear and Gucci? As unfortunate as this may sound, I believe that this was just the natural progression of things for Angela. All signs were there from the beginning, but the short answer is she's been bought. She's been paid for. These first few moments here are kind of going to feel like a lot. It's going to feel like I'm throwing a lot of information at you from a lot of different directions, and it might feel a little overwhelming, but just bear with me here. It's all relevant foreshadowing, and it's necessary because I want you to be able to see the juxtaposition between who Angela used to be and who she is today. Since the beginning of Angela's online history, she never liked to be told what to do. That's been made clear by her previous lifestyle of a wanderer. She described herself as homeless by choice so that she wasn't tied down to anyone or anything. She was regularly posting images of her new body on Instagram and complaining when the post got taken down. She was also raised Southern Baptist and described her upbringing as indoctrination. Her income came from her online store, Wear Goddess, where she would basically just shop at estate sales and resell the recycled fashion. She hasn't posted to this page since April 2022, so I think it's fair to say that she has abandoned the project. The earliest piece of online history I could find from Angela is her first available Instagram post in June 2016. She makes it sound like a rebirth for her, having deleted all of her previous Instagram 
Instagram posts. The main catalyst for this, I discovered, was the loss of a wanted pregnancy. It appears as though she was meant to have a child in August of 2016, but had sadly lost that pregnancy. She calls this baby Phoenix, another common reference to this sort of rebirth, and we'll see her use this theme a lot. Another theme that Angela uses a lot is blood, and specifically, I'm sorry, I'm sorry about this, I'm so sorry, menstrual blood. I'm gonna desaturate the following image and any other images that include Angela and her blood rituals and stuff, just so I'm not triggering anyone by the sight of blood. But when Angela miscarried Phoenix, this is a bit of a doozy here, but she bled onto a towel, she took a picture of it, and she wrote the following quote. There is nothing to fear once you've died and come back. Beg to meet your demons as soon as possible, then stepping into the dark is a joy typed one year ago on the blood of my son. And trust me, I understand how weird this probably seems to 99% of us. Having suffered two pregnancy losses myself, one of them was at 16 weeks, so it was like traumatizing as hell. I just want you to know that I absolutely understand the trauma of what she went through when she miscarried Phoenix. And while I don't think most of us would post an image like this, especially publicly, I'm asking that we all give Angela a break on this one. This appears to be how she dealt with the grief of her pregnancy loss, and we all grieve differently. At the time, she was clearly doing this to memorialize Phoenix, and it's not up to us to judge how a mother deals with the grief of losing a child. And like I mentioned before, Angela loves the blood of her womb. Even to this day, she uses it in rituals and waters her plants with it. Again, weird, sure, but she's not harming anybody. August 6, 2016, she wrote, today was my due date. Instead of giving birth, I'm having coffee with some beautiful surfers I met at sunrise, finding comfort in the rhythm of my irregular heartbeat and smiling like a two-year-old handed a bucket of crystals because I live with no regrets. I'm not vulnerable. I am me. Most people don't wear their hearts as a jacket over their skin suit. I do. I'm a broken woman, but my bones are being mended slowly by the gift of life. I live. Another post of hers from this time says the following. My existence is like this. I grew up in extreme poverty. I grew up without a father. The church fed me and clothed me. I've been f***ed, and I've been savaged in an alleyway in the middle of a Sunday, the Lord's Day in the South. I have loved women. I've lost a child and I've had two abortions to save my hemorrhaging life. I've been poorer than poor. Planned Parenthood will always receive a percentage of my money because they saved my life and my heart when I had neither. All of this is to say that Angela has been through some trauma. And the only reason I mention any of it is because it really does foreshadow her shift into the person we know her as today. Also, just for the sake of pointing out how much Angela has changed, she was using the hashtag Black Lives Matter in 2016 and seemed very passionate about its message. She also made a post that said, The pipeline will cease being built in the next two days. Hillary Clinton will win the presidency of the USA. I will ride horses with Lakota Sioux Warrior tomorrow, and I will leave this land the most magnificent Angela that I could ever become because of these experiences. She also made this post when Trump got elected in 2016, saying, I didn't sleep and I cried all night, and I'm over human know-it-alls. If you think your lifestyle is better than anyone else's, do you see who's set to be the next president of the United States? Do you see the polar bears that are wasting away in the Arctic and will be extinct in your grandchildren's lives, all if we don't change the way we're living? The old paradigm, my life is better than yours, ego-driven existence, isn't working. Angela also used to believe in the paranormal, such as aliens. She made many posts like this, but here's an interesting one. Today, for the first time in my entire life, I watched 11 portals open in broad daylight, and tonight, as I went out to my car at 11.11, a being jumped from the roof of the house onto the ground in front of me, and I smiled as familiar tears rolled down my face. This is a huge shift from what we see on social media today. The conservative witch who also believes in God. Honestly, I'm not even sure if she considers herself a witch anymore, because that belief system and esoteric lifestyle is basically the antithesis of Christianity. In her most recent post, she doesn't really mention being a witch. And then, of course, the existence of aliens is kind of a taboo subject among Christians. Ask any Christian if they believe in aliens and you'll get a different answer every time.
What made me kind of ache for Angela while researching this video is the fact that in late 2016, she spent weeks at the protest site of the Dakota Access Pipeline. If you'll recall, the pipeline and those protesting its construction was front page headline news at the end of 2016. Long story short, Native Americans in North Dakota and South Dakota, I'm pretty sure, particularly those on the Standing Rock Indian Reservation, had been holding protests of the pipeline alongside environmental activists because the pipeline had been rerouted to cross into their sacred land and underneath the Missouri River, which is their main water source. The possibility of that pipeline leaking into the river is obviously cause for concern, not only because of what it could do to the environment, but also to the health of the people who rely on it. And Angela was there, on the grounds, bringing supplies and donations to the protesting tribe. This was November and December in North and South Dakota, so temperatures were freezing. It was really beautiful and powerful to see her posts. Even the ones where she's giving away way too much information, like about how she was on her period at Standing Rock, but it was a moment in time where Angela actually cared about a real cause. She cared about other people. She fought for the vulnerable. She clothed and fed their children. She bathed in the river. She showed us that were outside of Standing Rock what conditions were like out there. She was real, she was kind, she was generous. This is an experience that 2023 Angela would not be caught participating in, and I say that because in 2020, there's this video where she expresses regret of giving into it. You know, I shared on here about going to uh, Standing Rock. I was at Standing Rock for several weeks. I think I was there. I don't remember. It was several years ago. It might've been like two months that I was there. I drove all around the state of Oregon, picking up herbs and plant medicine for the medical tents, drove all that medicine full, it, my car full of all that medicine to Standing Rock. And I stayed for weeks running errands to and from Walmart, buying thousands and thousands of dollars of propane tanks, food, cigarettes, you know, native, um, whatever those cigarettes are for the Native Americans who asked me to buy them tobacco, I would go buy children's toys and sleeping bags and tents. I spent thousands and thousands of dollars and then at the end of fighting at Standing Rock, I was the only white woman, I have photos, okay? I was the only white woman given a horse to ride on the front line with the Native American warriors, me. I was fighting, tear gas, protesting. I put my freaking elderly dog through hell, through a freaking South Dakota winter to fight at Standing Rock. Then I found out, and I got so much shit for this in my inbox, and I don't care. I found out the reason I left Standing Rock was because my elder told me that the tribe's already knew that the pipeline, which Donald J. Trump was villainized over, they already knew it was going in. They had already agreed. They sold the land. Then they set up this whole mini Wachoni standing rock thing to bring all of us together to raise more money when they already knew the pipeline was going in the entire time. Now, well played, right? Well played. You already get the money for the pipeline. Then you raise a shit ton more money by getting all these white people to rally and give you all these free supplies and free clothes and all this stuff. I mean, well played. No hatred from me. Like totally well done. Like well done. I would do the same thing. I mean, it's going to happen. The pipeline's going to go in. Might as well capitalize on this and get a lot of publicity. And then poof, Standing Rock just disappeared. What she says in this video seems difficult to fact check, which it shouldn't be hard to fact check this because the complaints that were put out by the natives are pretty well documented. But again, this video is from 2020 and this is after Angela kind of started to slip into who we see her as today. Anyway, unfortunately, after Trump took office, the construction of the pipeline was pushed through and is in operation today. Angela expressed extreme resentment while also suggesting that this happened because people spoke it and manifested it into truth. Yesterday I received a text from someone I hadn't seen in more than 10 years. She asked if the rumor was true, that our president signed the Dakota Access Pipeline into our American fate, 
and I wanted to throw my phone out the window. I wanted to scream, of course he did, since before he was president, didn't you want that? It's all anyone has been talking about. I was sitting on the ground at Standing Rock with my elder when he won the presidency, and immediately, everyone in camp and around the world started saying the same thing. Well, of course the Dakota Access Pipeline will go on. Trump has money in it. Guess what happened? Your wish came true. Where you put your attention is what grows. You talk about Trump in the pipeline, you manifest that it is cemented under the river. This time period was a formative part of Angela's life. A lot of traveling, wandering, and spiritual living, and also rubbing her lady blood all over her face. And throughout all this, we started hearing about something she called the Phoenix Experience. In the first post she made about it, she described it in this way. I am taking 22 witch women on the Phoenix Experience, an online four-week intensive leading goddesses through their deaths and rebirths uncovering the pieces of themselves that they've scattered across land and sea and sky. People who regularly followed Angela's social media posts were likely drawn to sign up, not because they wanted to uncover pieces of themselves, but probably more so because they were drawn in by Angela and her free spirit, her natural lifestyle, her mysterious ramblings that sounded like they should make sense, but maybe we just don't understand them because we're not on her spiritual level. Like I said earlier, I feel like this is something that we could all envy about Angela. There was a charm about the things that she posted. Even when she was talking about trauma, she managed to make it sound like she had it all figured out and that she was living her dream life. What is the Phoenix experience exactly? Well, it changes depending on who's in the particular circle of teachers, but it includes daily and weekly homework, videos and audios from me, meditations, journeying, individual work, and group work concerning manifestation, love, and relationship, bodies and physical realm, adornment and care of human body, plant and animal medicine, totems, guides, other dimensional learnings, and ways to connect with self to become greater than the dream that you've held, and so much more. She would start posting about this course a lot, regularly comparing it to death and then a rebirth. Angela allegedly was charging $666 for each participant to join the Phoenix Experience, and it wasn't just a sign up and show up kind of thing. Angela would conduct interviews to make sure that the people she accepted into her program were people who she aligned with. It originally took place online and over FaceTime. In February of 2017, she started holding what appeared to be in-person events, that she would call the Phoenix Ceremony. I can't find any information about what went on at these ceremonies. She usually overshares about everything, so maybe these first few Phoenix Ceremonies weren't successful, and that's why we didn't see her posting pictures and Instagram posts and stuff. However, the Phoenix experience in general appears to be where she first started making actual money. In this post, she said, 22 days. Yes, it costs money. I love money. If you love money, give it away to make more of it. Yes, you will thank me infinitely. That's very forward of her, but again, hey, we appreciate the honesty. In August of this year, she says in less than a year, she had taken homelessness and joblessness and turned it into a six-figure income. Remember, alongside the Phoenix experience, she also had her recycled clothing line, Wear Goddess, and I believe that she was starting to offer some financial workshops. In the months previous to the Phoenix experience, she posted a few different little courses that she was trying to hold here and there. The reason I'm focusing so heavily on the Phoenix experience is because it took a dark turn that would change Angela's life forever. In January 2022, a podcast surfaced called Mignite. The host is Swedish, and I know I'm pronouncing it wrong, so I'm sorry. In the episode titled, A Spiritual Awakening, Losing Our Religion, the hosts talk about how they met in a cult called the Phoenix Experience. A lot of people use the term cult way too loosely, and I'm guilty of this too. I probably do it way too much. <laughs> but the way that these women talk about their experience kind of does scream like actual cult to me. They never call Angela by name, I think for obvious legal reasons, but they do call her Mama Bird and Bird Mama. I managed to find one Instagram post throughout all of this where she refers to herself as Mama Bird. And as I listened to this podcast, I noticed the similarities between their words and Angela's posts. I am 
100% certain that bird mama slash mama bird is Angela. There is not a singular doubt in my mind. But just for the sake of covering my own butt here, yeah, they never directly name Angela. But in my opinion, they are talking about Angela's Phoenix experience. I am very confident in that opinion. Anyway, I'd just like to include some clips from the podcast here that I think really illuminate the truth about what actually went on at these gatherings, both online and in person. We all know that people can curate what other people see online the way that they want things to appear, and Angela was a master at this craft. But what we're about to hear is testimony from women who were actually there, and I believe that it's much more valuable than what Angela's posts were giving. So this portion here might be a little bit long, but these women are so engaging and fun and easy to listen to. So I hope that you'll find listening to them speak as enjoyable as I have. We both separately but together joined a an online global group that was meeting quite regularly, I would say, mm. for a 22-day experience initially called the Phoenix Experience. Big Bird Mama yeah. had a lot of charm, a lot of pull, and mm. a lot of big audience on, on the internet. So it was very engaging um, and very intimate. And I think the props were really great. Like, a lot of it was really, like, looking at yourself in intuitive light, looking at yourself in... Um, uh, really examining your desires, examining your hopes, examining your goals, um, examining your fears, examining your dark, yeah. your shadows, right? It was wonderful because it's not something that comes up in everyday conversation in normal social circles, mm -hmm. right? So we were invited into this, what we thought was a very safe place mm -hmm. to share, right? So basically, I was like, she can help me heal everything that's shitty in my life and make me happy. And I can find community and I can be a magic witch. It could take me hours to like walk home because I would be like, which way is the way that I should be taken home? Which, you know, oh. like, which path should I take? What's the purpose? Like, who the fuck cares? Just go home. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. And I should interject that Bird Mama lived on my property for the month of the experience. Um, did you know each other we before? We did not, that? so <laughs> I was in a very trusting mode, I guess. Um, I was I was also doing Airbnb, so it wasn't unusual for me to have people stay in this second unit, which was in my on my property, but not in my house. So I think that was the main reason why I was like, oh yeah, you can rent this space. I'm used to renting it to other people um, because Bird Mama was looking for a place to stay, and I think it's helpful mm -hmm. that people know that this person doesn't have a home, like a, a, yeah. a traditional home in the sense of space, they're traveling yeah. on the road all the time. Um, yeah. And so they they had asked for a place to stay, and so I said, yeah, you can rent this. After the 22-day experience, I felt great. I, I had paid for a 22-day experience, I felt like I got what I paid for, <laughs> and um, yeah. you know, we had said, oh, we want to keep in touch. This person had called me their family, like they made a point to say I was family to them. We had our first video Zoom calls with everybody on it. I felt like it was like the first day of the rest of my life, and I felt like um, I felt like I was walking around with a secret, mm. uh, like I was walking around with a secret and that I was like, I know life, I know, I have the, I'm learning life right now and you guys don't know anything. A week or two in, she just like disappeared, just mm. like you said about the mentoring, she just disappeared and I, I didn't want to question her because she was all knowing, you know, mm. that's how I felt at the time, I was like, oh she knows what she's doing, I wouldn't want to question her. And I was so brainwashed, dude. Like, I was, I mean, I know we were all in, in different different levels of brainwash, but I was really like, I was like, oh no, like, take my money and disappear. Uh, that's okay. <laughs> Whenever I did get in touch with her, for I don't remember exactly how that happened, but she was like, oh, I've been lying in a stream uh -huh. somewhere. And I was like, what are you? Like, a fucking, what, who are you? Baba Yaga? <laughs> like, what the fuck is this? And, but I was still like, oh yes, of course you have, master. It, it, like, just thinking about it now, it's just so weird that I was like, fine with that. But I remember there was one of the other people who were like, you know, I wanna, I wanna uh, talk to my birth dad. I've never, I've never talked to him. And Bird Mama was like, no, don't do it. I tried to talk to my birth dad and he uh, didn't want to talk to me. So you shouldn't talk to yours either. Cause he doesn't, if, if he's not in your life, it's because he doesn't want to be in your life. Right. And I remember feeling like something was breaking inside of me. It was like I was watching a bully beat somebody and I didn't do anything about it, but I, I got that feeling, but I felt like, but I can't question Bird Mama. <laughs> like, couldn't do that. I remember that 
was the first thing that happened that really sparked something inside of me that felt like something was very mm, wrong. That was your red flag, yeah. One bit, really big red flag mm -hmm. for sure. So some of the th activities that, um, that would be set up for us in order to create this intense bond were things like uh, sharing deep secrets. So like saying, you know, you're gonna share yeah. a secret, something you've never told anyone mm -hmm. before, and this is gonna be a safe container for that. And that was then used for manipulation later. Or another way yeah. to create a really intense bond was to give up something, like something you owned, like a, a some piece of, it could be anything, it could be a photograph or jewelry or whatever, a piece of clothing, something that was really intimate to you that you thought you could never live without. She'd be like, that's the thing you need to yeah. give up and you're gonna send it to your sister. So she would have us call each other sisters. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and you're like, oh, okay. So I'm gonna send, I'm gonna yeah. send my grandmother's heritage, whatever. Like people were doing this. They were sending their their most prized possessions to really a stranger across the world who had no connection to the intimacy of that item, and then yeah. um, forcing a like you said, forcing a really intimate bond that wouldn't normally exist between yeah. people. So those were just some of the things. Um, and I think the secrets were probably the most detrimental. I sent Bird Mama uh, a ring. Um, that my mama mm -hmm. gave me, that my mama yeah. gave me. That was a really beautiful, like, medieval repli replica with a lapis lazuli stone that I really loved. And I remember when she, when I, because uh, I think it was like a, she made us those these videos that she, where she, that's how she communicated with right. us, you know? Like, she sent, sent us videos, so she sent me a video saying like, send the most, like, beautiful thing you have, like you said, like, the, the thing that holds the most significance mm -hmm. to you. And I was like, I was like looking down at my hand and I was like, fuck. I'm gonna have to send her my ring. And I, I mean, imagine, imagine the power somebody holds over you where you feel like, oh my God, I have to right. do this in order to be whatever it is. Like I had no trust in myself that I could, that I could just say no or send something else. Mm. Like that was really fucked. <laughs> it's narcissistic behavior. It's the love bombing, yeah. getting you to bond with me immediately, getting you to exactly. trust me. I'm going yeah. to overly um, create this this alternate reality that's not sustainable yeah. for any relationship where we're like we love each other we're bonded we're family we, mm -hmm. we share we're intimate and that i'm gonna bounce i'm gonna not show mm -hmm. up for periods of time and then i'm also going to 100 percent use everything that you just showed of me and mm -hmm. to manipulate you for yeah. more of whatever i want more money yeah. more more audience more um places to stay more <laughs> more clothes yeah. more jewelry you know whatever it was yeah. And the, the constant also pitting us against each other in a way, because mm -hmm. I remember everybody wanted to be the, the baddest witch, everybody wanted to be like her favorite. Oh yes. So I remember being like, oh, this week, this person is, is not really this week, but like a star oh, people. Yeah, yeah, there was totally a star. Yeah, pretty week. much and everybody wanted to have like a gold star. It was like, I was like, oh, I hope I will be like featured <laughs> right. as the best witch this week. You know, it was like, I wanted to do all the assignments so well. So it, it, I didn't even do it for me. I did it so that she could tell me that I was good. You know, nobody wants to say I was in an abusive relationship. You know, nobody thinks that they're ever going to get into. No one goes, you know what I really want right now? <laughs> it's yeah. a really abusive relationship, right? So yeah. no one intends to. We're all susceptible as humans. Like we're all susceptible to the, the need and desire to like be wanted, to be yeah. seen, to connect. And I don't think that's bad, like susceptible makes it sound like it's disease, you know? Yeah. Um, that's just human, like we want that. Um, and and I think she wanted that too. And what yeah. is ironic is that she got what she initially, I think, set out for, which was to create community, yeah. but didn't know what to do with it. Exactly. And so then kind of started down a really manipulative, narcissistic cult pathway mm -hmm. that was leading to a really harmful environment, a violent environment. Like I would, I would say it was violent to the point yeah. where um, people were really getting hurt. And she had sent an email once that was like, "Tomorrow we are all fasting all day. I don't care what your relationship to food uh, is. Yeah, I don't so care. Terrible. Yeah, I don't care if you have like a sickness that means you have to eat. Blah blah blah. You, we are all fasting." And I remember thinking like, "Okay, she knows best. <laughs> mm -hmm. Like no question about it." And I've always had like some food re food related anxiety. You know, I remember I fasted. Uh, a few more times after that until I realized that this is an eating disorder. <laughs> this is turning into an eating disorder because what felt good for me was the fact that I didn't have to think about food. Uh, also super dangerous if anybody in there had had like anorexia before or any yeah. sort of actual, you know, that that, that could have triggered uh, an, an, an old eating disorder. It was insanely uh, uh, irresponsible. Yeah. She would 
talk about fasting a lot. Like she would um, talk about how she had been doing it or was doing it yeah. in the moment. And yeah, uh, the requiring of everyone in the group to do that was extremely detrimental, I'm sure, to many people. Um, and yeah, dangerous. Like if you have a medication that it says you need to take your medication with food, you know, it's like, yeah. don't do that. Please don't ever do that. And I think about like, why did we all stay? And, and one, I didn't want to lose the people that I had met, right? I didn't want to lose the circle of friends. I didn't really care about losing her. <laughs> I was like, well, yeah. Yeah. you were a vehicle to get to these wonderful yeah. people that I've met. So leading up to the dark turn I mentioned earlier, Angela started posting regularly about this in-person gathering that she would be hosting. The foreshadowing she gives is so eerie, almost as if she knew what was coming. I have to wonder, if Angela was actually as clairvoyant as she wanted all of us to believe that she was, would she have even held this gathering in the first place, knowing what was to come? September 2017, about one month before the in-person gathering, she made this post. If you're ever wondering where I am, look in a graveyard. Death is my favorite pastime. The Phoenix experience was born out of death. My own. My child's. Death is the best joke we've ever been told. It gives us the chance to look at why we're alive and to do better next time. Next breath. Next love. October 24th, 2017, on her way to the plot of land the gathering would be held, she posted in all caps, This is our season. The season of the Witch of Death of Truths, revealed of my son, the Phoenix, and of the complicated being human fuck-all game of living. Let's play. And play they would. Play to the point where someone would lose their life. She started talking about wanting to have a meetup, a real-life meetup, in Oregon, where I happen to live. So I was like, oh, I'm definitely going. <clears throat> and I want to meet all these people that I've been so deeply bonded with. So we paid to stay at this beautiful resort out in the wilderness, out in the middle of nowhere. We paid for our food and we paid for, um, you know, this event experience, which was four days. Some really traumatic events happened the second day we were there, which happened to be Halloween, uh, which mm. is favorite day, Samhain. Yeah. And um, one of the women who came to the event had some pre-existing conditions. They had stopped kind of taking some of their medication um, and they were feeling really well, like physically well, for the last kind of six months, and they attributed a lot of that to the experience that they were having with, mm -hmm. with the Phoenix experience, um, with all the work that they were doing. Um, but this person had a seizure, and this person passed away at the event, and it was very um, sudden, very just tragic and so heartbreaking. Um, I had really just met this person for the first time, you know, two days ago, yeah. and um, of course there was emergency responders that came, like a helicopter came, and, and uh, ambulance and police, like it just descended into the middle of the mm -hmm. desert, and, and people were trying to, you know, resuscitate this person for hours, um, but were unable to do that. And so this, of course, changed the event, and we probably all should have gone home. I don't know. Honestly, I don't know what the right response was, but we all decided oh. to stay, and in hopes, I think, of processing what had just happened. Um, yeah. But something really interesting happened during that event and that we were all questioned, maybe not all of us, but many of us were questioned by the police individually. Mm -hmm. The police thought that something weird was happening <laughs> in that they, they yeah. thought, what are these, what is this group of women doing in the middle of the desert yeah. by themselves? Calling themselves witches. Calling themselves witches with this very clearly outspoken um, leader who, yeah. and now a woman has passed away. And, and they, I think initially mm -hmm. they were like, what are the circumstances of this? Um, because from the outside, and it does not look good. It does not look like, uh, it looks sketchy. Um, and I wish I knew more about the woman that passed away because you know I can't really speak to her, her own, her own experience and conditions. But um, yeah, it, it did. It did warrant investigation. And so we were all interviewed, and I had to like go into a police car with a policeman, and they mm -hmm. asked me. Why are you here? Who is this person to you? Are you paying them money? Like, they were like, this is a cult. <laughs> yeah. They saw it exactly immediately for what it was, regardless of um, really outside of the fact that someone had died there. Like, they were like, what is going on with this group of people? Um, and they saw that it was something to, something of a red flag. So after answering those questions, you know, to an outside source, <laughs> really got you thinking like, oh, wait a minute. Yeah. Th there is something sus about this from an outside yeah. perspective. Maybe I should yeah. be questioning this a little bit more, you know? Maybe yeah. I should... But if they're asking all of these questions as if they already know what's going on. Right. 
that that's bound to make you feel like why how do they know oh because it's an actual fucking cult right <laughs> like, yeah. and what was fascinating is when mama bird came in from being questioned she made it sound as though she had just recruited this policeman's family into the group but they were so intrigued by what she was doing that they were like oh this sounds beautiful and wonderful and cool and i want to be a part of it and ironically looking <laughs> back you see oh this person the police the policeman made her feel so comfortable <laughs> that, they, that she would share with them the information yeah. about what was really going on here um yeah. to make it to make it seem like they were validating her you know we sat around the fire and talked about her those of them, those people that knew her well, and you know, really made a pact, like an mm -hmm. oath, to honor her. And this sticks with me because what followed did not honor her at all. Look, I don't want to blame Angela for this woman's death. Her name was Cherie, by the way. It might be Sherry. It's spelled S-H-E-R-E-E. -E. So I'm saying Cherie. Anyway, I think there are probably some people who are going to have a difference in opinion on this one, and that's totally fine. That's your opinion. This is my opinion. Do I think that Angela meant for someone to die at her gathering? No, of course not. Do I think that she contributed to Cherie's death by way of irresponsibility? In my 100% honest personal opinion yes and the only reason i say that is because of the women on the podcast saying that she had a pre-existing condition and she wasn't taking her medication anymore and that she had been attributing her choice to stop taking medication to the way she was feeling having been in the phoenix experience did angela tell her to stop taking her medication i don't know no one knows none of us are gonna know for sure however Angela, today especially, is pretty anti-medication, anti-pharmaceutical, more like pro-natural, like herbs and all those things. So if I had to guess, my opinion is that I think that she had some influence over Cherie's decision in that, but I don't know that for sure just my opinion. And we also don't really know exactly what went on at this gathering. Was there a situation that Cherie was put into that triggered a seizure? Was there an event that she probably shouldn't have been taking part in? Should Angela, as the leader of the Phoenix Experience, have taken responsibility to make sure that someone at her gathering that had a pre-existing condition, was not taking medication, was accommodated for. I personally believe so. And while I think it's unfair to say that Angela murdered somebody or killed somebody, I think her death could have been avoided. November 2nd, 2017, Angela began posting about Cherie's death. I mourn the loss of my Phoenix baby Cherie, who I met on Instagram a year ago, and who I met in real life in the desert at the Phoenix gathering on the night before she died, October 31st, 2017. I love you in the stars and the flames. I love you in the song and the moon. I love you in the prayer and with no hair. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You changed my life by being a perfect example of truth, beauty, and light. I've known you for eternities. See you soon, angel baby. To the Phoenix Sisterhood, you are everything and more. I am honored to stand amongst you most badass women on any planet. The hashtag being human challenge ended with death. I never could have known. And now comes the rebirth. Thank you for being here with me. Trust me when I say meeting on social media is worth all the effort. It is real life. This is real life. Bless you. On November 4th, she continued. Her name was Cherie Wilder. She died at the Phoenix Gathering on Halloween. Sawin. All Souls Eve. I am not answering any messages or questions regarding her death. Please respect her transition. She doesn't ride on the wings of an angel. She is the angel. A true witch chooses her time of death and perfectly aligns all of the circumstances to make an effortless and graceful next move. I am in awe. Cherie, you are my second child, and you are held by my son who went before you. Thank you for everything you've been and continue to be for me and so many. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I love you. Forever family. This post kind of seems distasteful to Cherie's loved ones. Imagine that someone you love dies at some like secretive gathering like this. And the person leading that gathering is just like, oh, she chose to die. Dude, that's mad sketchy, okay? That raises way more questions and red flags. On November 7th, she posted, It isn't confusing and I have nothing to hide. 
a woman chose to die when she did, weaving the perfect web for her own perfect life. It isn't sad. It isn't a tragedy. It isn't anything short of a miracle. She knew exactly what she was doing when she left her body on Halloween at a women's gathering in the middle of nowhere on sacred native land. She was a magnificent witch, the most powerful I've ever seen. I literally have no words for the gift she has given us all. Talk about a queen supreme. And I'm done trying not to step on anyone's toes. I bless and honor her journey, and I won't let you make it ugly. She died the way she wanted, surrounded by infinite love and freedom. The spider was crawling outside of her cabin on the day the phoenix gathering ended. You are everywhere now. You are the flame. Thank you, Cherie. I love you. The phoenix experience goes on because you demand it does. Death is sad, Angela. She literally died the day after you met her in person. To pretend like she meant so much to you, while also acting like her accidental death was not a sad tragedy, is tone deaf and strange. But apparently this wasn't the end of the story. This is another part that we don't really have like exact play-by-play -play details on, but apparently Angela displayed some not so great behavior at Cherie's funeral, which was an event that she demanded that no other Phoenix Experience members attended except for her. Mama Bird made it known that they, it, she was going to go to the funeral. She was going to deliver this person's belongings to their family and no one else was invited. No one was to go with. And some people really question that, I think because they lived near the person that passed away and they wanted, they were friends with her and wanted to be a part of this. And so they, they pushed back against that, but Mama Bird was adamant that no, only she was going to go, and only she was going to deliver the things, and only she was going to be present at the funeral. And that was also yeah. very strange. Yeah, there was this real kind of desire to like move forward with what we were doing before. And Bird and Mama was like, You're, we're all going to keep going with this event. We're going to do what, it's what she would have wanted, you know, putting it on her that uh, we would be honoring to her if we, if we continued. Um, but the next morning it was very obvious that Bird Mama was distraught as well. She had cut her hair with a knife, like she had hair down yeah. to her butt, and she had just taken a, I don't know, a dull hunting knife and literally just really? dropped it like next to her jaw. Fuck. Yes, this is when the hair. That, that was when she cut her hair, or that it happened. That oh way. yes, okay. yes. Okay. That's the way it happened. That initiated a, a bunch of haircuts. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> a bunch I of knew people cutting their hair. Cutting the hair all of a sudden. I was like, what? When did this happen? I just know she was the first. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. That's what initiated, and it was. Uh, I mean. I think it's a real like ancient sign of grief like you know when people will shave their head or cut their hair kind of to show that they're um they're in mourning or that they're distraught or you know that a big shift has happened and um she started using verbiage that really oddly took accountability for what had just happened but really i mean n there was no foul play like no one had initiated this person's death in any way or yeah. caused it um, but there was a lot of verbiage around like I'm responsible for, for everyone here and I'm responsible for I think that's why she was using that verbiage to be like I'm gonna take her things and I'm gonna go see her family yeah. and you know I want to control mm -hmm. this situation Maybe that was so also what she wanted that she was like it's my fault yes. just so that she could take it yeah. yep she went so far as to say you need to make sure that people don't know about what happened mm -hmm. Um, and you don't need to share this experience with your loved ones mm -hmm. or with your partner or whoever. And I was like, oh, this is shady yeah. as fuck. You yeah. know, this is, a, this is getting weirder and weirder and weirder. And we were all really curious to find out what had happened at the funeral. You know, we wanted to know, like, what, what, um, you know, we wanted to feel connected in our collective grieving to the family. Um, and so what she shared with us was really strange. While I think these women give a much deeper insight than anyone else, Here's how Angela described the funeral and her behavior while attending it. I fucked up today. I did my best, but it wasn't good enough. I failed the Phoenix Sisterhood. I failed myself. And I'll never forgive myself, and for the rest of my days, I will honor, defend, and protect my sisters in life and death. I vow. I'm sorry. To those at Cherie's service, to disrespect a witch after she's dead is the greatest atrocity. While I'd like to respect the family of the witch, there is nothing you can do to save your soul once you slaughter a witch who has already left her body. To dishonor her in death is to dishonor her in life. To use the divine 
aka her own divinity against her is reaffirming your own torment. A witch is the divine. Good luck now. You may think heaven is outside yourself, but Cherie knows and I know heaven is right here, right now. Be here now. There is no future. I can't believe I didn't do everything in my power to fight for you, Cherie. But I was scared and I didn't know what to do. I will never hide behind fear of the church and of what they've done to both of us ever again. I vow. I'm learning more and more every day. This medicine of the phoenix is the greatest lesson of all my lives, and I'll do better next time. I'm so sorry. I love you. It really makes you wonder what made Angela so upset. Maybe it was awake and she was mad that her body had been pumped with chemicals and formaldehyde and all that instead of being like buried naturally in the earth or even cremated. I think I've only been to three funerals in my life. None of them have been necessarily like super religious or even like ceremonial. Funerals are for the living. I get that. The last one I was at, I remember getting really pissed off because it was like textbook if that makes sense. Like, almost like it was scripted. And there were great speakers there who knew my friend who passed and like his best friend spoke and I sobbed like a baby. Like there were a lot of great parts about that service, but then like the people actually leading the service were giving the very textbook scripted, like typical stuff you'd expect to hear at any funeral. And it made me mad because I'm like, this is not helping me with my grief at all. You guys didn't know him. Like you guys are just saying a bunch of fake shit and it made me mad. I was also grieving though, so. I mean, it was probably irrational anger and I'm sure not everyone at the funeral felt that way, but maybe it was something like that. You know, maybe Angela put up a fuss because she felt like it was kind of dishonest and by the book and, you know, could have been something like that. But she does make it sound like she did put up a bit of a fuss about something she didn't like there. And that's not her place to do that. She had literally just met this woman. It sounds like she wants ownership over Cherie's death, but doesn't want to take responsibility for it. Angela's posts only began to get more spiraling and strange during this time. Admittedly, she went through a traumatic experience because, again, I don't think Angela wanted Cherie to die. A kind of downward spiral given her experience makes sense, but the circumstances are really unusual. I'm not good with secrets, so I'll tell you, the past couple of months have fucking sucked. A woman died in front of my face. A woman I loved and was instrumental in changing her entire life. A woman who chose to spend her final moments with her Phoenix sisters. And then I didn't listen to her. She came and she screamed at me. She whispered at all times of the day and night. She told me what was going on and I said, not my business. I'll let them figure it out for themselves. She sent all my guidance back to me. Those who were on hiatus for the past six months. And I disrespected her once. I didn't get on stage and stop the joke of a funeral, and I watched her husband walk out without defending her, and I didn't listen to her, even when she broke my brand new rental car in the parking lot of her funeral so I couldn't leave. And I still didn't listen when she entered my body. I didn't listen when I fucked up over and over again. Because I'm human. But today came the relief that only the winter solstice can bring. I absolutely stood up for her, and I defended her when no one else did. And if I die today with this shortest day, I know that I stood by my sisterhood. I will forever. I love you, Cherie. Thank you. With time, people began dropping out of the Phoenix experience. Angela said that she was going to keep it going because Cherie was demanding it. Spoiler alert, I know you all are going to find this absolutely shocking, but Angela stopped doing the Phoenix experience. Uh, whoa. In response to people saying that Angela had been leading the Phoenix experience as a cult, here is what she had to say. Oh my god, y'all, I'm not a cult leader. Apparently every cult leader says this, but in all seriousness, if I was a cult leader, I would certainly demand a lot more of my cult attendees than their cultivation of personal freedom. Angela continued posting about Cherie's death year after year near Halloween. As the speakers from the podcast mentioned, she had chopped her hair off in memory of Cherie. She mentions it a lot at the time and for a few years after, and I'm bringing attention to it because it's important later on. When I chopped my waist length hair off to an inch all over my head, I absolutely felt basic. I felt like my powers were gone, except the reason I did it was because a woman died in front of me and she was an indigenous woman and that's how I grieved the loss. Yep. 
In case you wondered why I went from long-haired goddess to unraveling, unstable queen, it's because a woman who was in my course, the Phoenix Experience, died in front of me on Halloween last year. The same day I conceived my son, Phoenix, two years previous to that day. After announcing she was a witch at my Phoenix gathering and then dying on her sacred witch holiday, Samhain, it was a basic bitch lesson in humility for me. One last weird mention about Cherie's death, Angela says at one point that she was possessed by Cherie. And here's what happened in Angela's words. Once upon a time, a client of mine died in front of me and then she possessed me to prevent her husband from falling in love with someone else. And although I was crystal clear what was happening, I didn't know what to do. I stayed in my integrity, but in the meantime, lost a lot of clients and those who looked up to me because I was too human apparently. Since being possessed is such a normal human thing. That last part must be targeted at someone from the podcast because at one point, one of them says this. When that person is, is called out, um, immediately it's defensive, immediately, like you said, it's I'm the victim, um, everyone is out to get me now, and uh, it's always a reflection on the other person. There's never any ownership of like, oh, you know what, maybe I shouldn't have done that. It was just immediately, oh, this person reacted this way to me because they have problems, and I'm their mirror, and I'm not even really human, I'm just here to be a reflection of you. Um, yeah. So just immediately, like, that is so backing funny. out of any so ownership. <laughs> I'm not even human, so I can't deal with this human thing. Like, you have the most human reactions ever. Like, you take everything personally, how can you not be human? Life only kept throwing punches at Angela after this. Allegedly, around Easter of 2018, Angela experienced yet another pregnancy loss in what she calls a near-death experience. Throughout the years after this, we often hear her say that when this happened, she died for 11 minutes. And from what I could gather, it was from severe loss of blood during the miscarriage. Up until this point, I gotta tell you, Angela was posting all the time, every day, even multiple times per day, for like two years, when suddenly her posts became less frequent. And they seemed to be indicative of a mental struggle of sorts. And I think that's for obvious reasons. Any of us would go through hell if we had watched someone die in front of us and then a few few months later nearly die ourselves from a miscarriage gone wrong. At one point she brings up that she thought she had a mental illness, claiming she heard voices in her head and was talking to the dead. In November 2018, she received backlash from this post in which she wrote things like, it's okay if you're racist, it's okay if you're a cheater, it's okay if you cheat in order to feel good about yourself. I mean, she has a lot of it's okay ifs in this particular post, but the it's okay if you're racist part, really justifiably so, made a lot of people be like, why the hell would you say that? Hey, Angela, it's okay to condemn behavior that is objectively harmful. Acknowledging that something exists does not make it okay. It just acknowledges that it's a thing. <laughs> Needless to say, Angela seemed to have scrapped the Phoenix experience at this point. She bounced around between new projects and courses. She called one the Create Your Life virtual workshop, and it sounds like it was some kind of manifestation workshop, go figure. She also had a winter solstice workshop that she said would change the participants' course of their lives. Okay, this particular project of hers I found to be extremely disturbing. She called it the Everybody Loves Bodies movement, and here's how she described it. Women, what would happen if you open wide? You might just get what you've always wanted. I'm starting a new project. One, women, email me or DM me a photo of you naked, in nature or in your bathroom, anywhere you want. Open yourself to being seen. Send with it a caption telling me and all women and men how you now choose to be open and what being truly open and seen means to you. We need to see your precious body. All body colors, types, sizes, and every other descriptor are welcome here. Two, I will edit it beautifully. This goes without saying, but I'll say it anyway, to be clear. I will never ever share an unedited photo. I will cover your bits, then delete the original photo from my device. My account is super password protected, and no one could guess it if they tried unless they're as powerful a witch as me, and they're not. Three, I will post to my account and tag you. 
This is a self-love movement, and in my greatest human revelation, I have found that the only way to open to who I came here to be is to open wide in full transparency and be myself. Allow myself to be seen, love myself so much that everything I want just flows right into my experience because there is no resistance to anything, to being seen, filled, holy, to being me in my naked transparency. Angela has had a lot of strange little projects here and there over the years, but this one is too much. She literally got on social media, solicited nude images from her followers, and then posted them publicly on Instagram. Now, it is important to note here that she had a separate Instagram account at the time, and that account no longer exists, it's been deleted, or maybe she just changed the handle or something like that, but you can't find these pictures anymore. I think they've been lost to space and time, which is probably for the best. And listen, if you want to post artistic, tasteful nudes on your Instagram, I think you should be allowed to do that as long as your account is marked as explicit material and like private so that, you know, minors don't come across it because I think, can't you get on Instagram according to their terms and conditions by the time you're like 13 or something like that? Yeah, that stuff should be behind a restricted wall. But yeah, it's one thing for you to post those kind of images yourself because you want to, but don't do it just because your favorite influencer is just like, hey, you should send me these very explicit pictures of yourself. Most importantly, just maybe don't send this to an influencer at all. How about that? I just feel like this particular project of hers was out of line and honestly disturbing. Soon after, she started pushing her new women's initiative called the Basic Witch Mystery School. I believe tuition to this one month course started at $1,100 and was raised over time. And while she continued to come up with new projects here and there, including this woman's business mastermind where she says she's teaching how she went from homeless and in debt to earning six figures and paying cash for a brand new Lexus, she ended up really solidifying her commitment to the basic witch mystery school for a while. So much so that two years after the death of Cherie, she decided to finally hold another in-person gathering for this, in which she jokes how no one died this time. Tasteful, Angela. I'd say that this is the time where Angela started publicly displaying the problematic behaviors that she's known for today. While there were certainly little comments that she would make or red flags popping up here and there, she started making these beliefs of hers not only known, but like declared. For example, in this post from February 2019, she says that she couldn't have had her sexual awakening without being, um, great. So when something happens, like um, an, an astral or a psychic or a physical attack, as I've shared before, I have been um, raped. So when something like a physical attack happens, it isn't that I don't have compassion for people who have experienced sexual trauma, it's just that I fully believe that every interaction, everything that happens to us is showing us something about ourselves. I've been able to share with my partner that I believe very fully that the only way I could come into sexual awakening and sexual and relational tantric union with another was being cracked wide open, wide open. And that's what a rape is. It's a violation. It is a, it is a, it is a ripping open of someone else. It is a violation and it is trauma. I'm not saying that it's not trauma. I believe that I had to experience that trauma in order to fully understand what it means to be cracked wide open. And up until this point, she had mentioned that trauma plenty of times and she'd been pretty open about her kind of wild and free relationship with her sexuality. But up until this point, I don't ever recall her framing it as this almost positive thing. It's honestly disgusting. Turfy Angela starts to make a more regular appearance at this point too, saying that, I won't use the word whim X, Y, Z in when I don't agree that a woman is anyone who chooses to be. That's called free thought and word, and you have your own too. That I won't use non-PC inclusive words to satisfy someone else's need for comfort when my entire job is to break your comfort zone and push you into your self-fulfilled desire to dwell in the discomfort as you shatter all of your perceptions, including the ones you have of me. That I don't do all kind of squishy, lovey, feel good things and instead make you wonder if what you've believed to be true really is true. 
Okay, so right now we have to tackle a sad topic that I believe played a pivotal role in evolving Angela into who she is today. Her dog, Audrey Jones, or more commonly referred to as just Jones. So when I mentioned earlier that there was a certain charm about her and her lifestyle, I think a lot of it came from how she was constantly posting about her adventures with Jones, who was an elderly mutt. I mentioned she was elderly because, well, I think you know where this is going. Sorry. Her relationship with Jones was clearly close. I'd guess that it was the strongest bond that she held with any living thing. And you could tell that she was a perfect companion animal and the sweetest soul you'd ever see in a dog. Jones went with her to Standing Rock and mingled with the horses. She was with Angela through the traumatic events leading up to this point in her life. She was beloved by all of Angela's followers and had been with Angela for, at this point, half of Angela's life. December 2019 is when Angela had to finally say goodbye to Jones. And I have to say, after spending days scrolling through Angela's social media and realizing that Jones no longer appeared in Angela's current social media posts, I dreaded coming across this post. I mean, I knew it was coming, and even though I knew it was coming, I couldn't have prepared myself for it. I teared up, honestly. I had a hard time writing this part of the script. And it's probably not for the reason you think, actually. Anyway, here is the post that made me tear up the most. For the sake of context, she ended up having Audrey skinned so that she could keep her hide. And many of us probably would think that this is strange. And while this is something that I would never do because like it would weird me out too much to do that, I understand the sentiment. So I'm not gonna judge her for this, despite how odd it seems. I'm closing my eyes and putting my head into your scruff as you sniff the air. I can feel your heartbeat. I know your devotion to peace and goodness. Today, I picked up your carcass from the tanner. He wept as he carried your body to my car. He told me this was the hardest job that he's done in more than 12 years. He said you were so kind, so gentle, gorgeous, and good. He said skinning you made him cry because he could feel our love and your purity. I thanked him and told him I'd see him in nine months when your hide is tanned. Nine months? A full gestation. Though you were double wrapped in black trash bags and then in several towels and sheets, I could feel your body. I know it so well. I could smell you. I could hear your heartbeat, I swear. You took your final ride in the passenger seat and I didn't take my hand off of you for the entire two and a half hours, even though the road was icy and slick. I was magnetized to your tiny form. I couldn't breathe. I miss you so much, even though I know better. I'm so lonely without you. There isn't anyone else I want to tell all my secrets to. When I unwrapped your body, I didn't cry. There were no more tears. I stared in awe. The muscles and tendons and bones were so perfectly intact. The Skinner took his time and made sure he never nicked your coat or your tender body. His expertise was honed in working on your magical self. Even in death, you are the ultimate teacher. As I performed my ritual, I envisioned you returning to the wild, to me. I saw you running free. I felt the ease and transition for you and the still deeply painful struggle for me. I would take that struggle for your freedom any day. I ran out of gas on the way out of the forest, but there was a rescuer. You sent them, don't you always? I am safe and protected. You did your only job, to keep me alive long enough so that I could see the worth. I see it because of you. No one will ever understand why I cry at every single sunset from now until forever. Why I will never eat peanut butter again. Why white is the only color that matters to me now. Our love was a once in a million lifetimes love, but because we lived it, we know it's possible. Come back soon. I live to see you again. So yeah, obviously it's sad to lose a pet, but the thing that I realized while reading through this part of Angela's social media is that she never once used Audrey Jones' death to sell a course. She used the miscarriage of her son Phoenix to brand the Phoenix experience for goodness sake. But with the passing of Jones, you could feel the genuine heartbreak and mourning and for once, Angela wasn't using that tragedy to get ahead. I believe that the last remaining bit of humanity left in Angela died alongside Audrey Jones. Something fascinating about Angela 
is that things always seem to come full circle with her. And just like the Phoenix, this was not only the death of Jones, but the rebirth of a new, far less favorable Angela. I don't think I need to explain this, but 2020 was a rough year for most of us. And for some of us, it was formative. For others, it was humbling. It was divisive. And in more ways than one, depending on who you ask, it was rage-inducing. For Angela, 2020 was the year when everything shifted for her. She would tell you it was the beginning of her true success and happiness. I'll tell you, it was the start of her unfounded bigotry and greed, and the end of her humanity as we know it. Death and rebirth. And of course, in true Angela fashion, she started out the year hosting a course called Design 2020, which obviously didn't age well, but she later went on to say how she had tried to tell us all that 2020 was going to be the shit show that it was through that course. The reality is, there's no way that anyone could have accurately predicted what would happen to the world that year. She was doing her thing, hosting masterclasses, and making way too much money. Then, the pandemic. Angela was in Paris at the time, and ended up quarantining there for one month. The interesting part is that she doesn't seem upset about the lockdown. If you're so clairvoyant, and you knew this pandemic was going to flip the world upside down, why are you so calm? For the first time, Angela started posting long-form content on her Instagram, which is understandable because what else are you going to do when you're cooped up indoors? Her content started out as mostly calming exercises and addressing the fears that came along with this period of the unknown. Sometimes they were breathing exercises, sometimes they were daily affirmations. She was soothing, and she came off in a compassionate way. Things didn't stay that way for long, though. After about two weeks of quarantine, she gave us the first dribbles of her refusal to comply with the times, but they started off sounding more like, hey guys, this is just the wake-up call we all needed. She even made a post saying that we should be thankful that the coronavirus was a thing because suddenly we were all united. Give thanks for the coronavirus, this pandemic that is sweeping the world. We've all been waiting to be united. We've all been looking for a different pace in our lives. And we have it now. <laughs> and in a way, that was true. For the first time, perhaps in human history, the world was going through the exact same struggle at the exact same time. And people were scared, lost, and confused. Angela really tried to be a beacon of hope for her followers for a second there, until she couldn't handle it anymore. In the meantime, she managed to make it back to the United States and just focused on creating more digital master courses. In April, she came out with her emotional mastery course for $333 alongside an interactive Active program called Money Games, Playing is Winning. After two weeks, she raised the price of that first course to $555, or you could bundle those two courses I mentioned together for $888. And if you're asking who would pay this woman that much money for financial coaching, apparently a lot of people did. Angela basically pioneered the whole pandemic scammer initiative that we saw so many influencers do in the same way that we saw MLM numbers rise dramatically during the same time period. And she pioneered it well. She came out with course after course, preying on people who had been laid off by their jobs due to the pandemic, preying on the fear of those who have lost income, maybe they lost their businesses. One of these courses was called the Money Magic Course and Angela described it in the following way. Tomorrow, I get to walk 60 plus women through the journey of breaking down all their money blocks, dismantling all knowns about earning and receiving, upending any old stories and replacing them with new openness, creating a community of queens committed to their own greatness while uplifting one another. She raised her prices for those courses that were bundled again in May, $666 for one, or $1,111 for both of them. In the same video, she also makes sure that she interjects how she feels about masks. Should we all just stay in our homes forever? Should we all just do what we're told to do because we're told to do it? And I challenged her and I asked her in a very kind, kind way, because she had told me before to wear a mask and I, I'm not going to wear a mask. 
During the summer of 2020, she liked to make sure that we all knew how well she was doing financially. According to her, she had a quarter million dollars in her savings account, was bragging about being able to buy a house with cash if she wanted to. She was also coming out with a monthly indefinite membership where the first 100 people to sign up would be able to pay $100 per month forever, and the price would double for everyone after that. For the record, $100 from 100 people per month would equal a $10,000 paycheck for Angela every month forever. And that would just be in addition to what she was charging for her courses, like hundreds of dollars per person signing up for her course. While millions of people around the world were in financial turmoil because of the pandemic, Angela was just thriving off of their fears and off of their hopes that they would be able to find some kind of financial security through Angela, through her energy, through her courses, whatever the reason was. She was profiting off of all of it. And as her wealth grew, so did her belief in conspiracies. The BLM movement, the trans movement, okay, all of these religious like dogmatic principles, these people trying to control you with what they believe to be true. Look at the smoke. It's so crazy. <clears throat> it's not happening because it's fire season. Look up in the sky at the chemtrails. They're controlling the weather with chemicals. And I was really sad this morning just thinking about the bears and the mountain lions and the coyotes and the wolves and the little tiny birds and the insects and the butterflies that are all so confused about these fires and these chemicals. Imagine those birds flying through these chemicals, these chemtrails. This is happening all day long. So you just like turning away from the political agenda, you like absorbing misinformation, spreading misinformation, rooting for a team that you really don't know that much about, just following the, the herd, the sheep, this is all contributing to our collective suffering right now. It's all contributing to our collective world, these fires, the insanity that's happening. This video is interesting to me because she mentions her belief in chemtrails when literally just two years prior, she had made this post where she mentions trying to talk a guy down from believing that chemtrails were real. Also, I would say that this is when she had really reached her peak of spiraling into right-wing conspiracy theories. You're scrutinized for having a differing opinion. You're, you're actually villainized for not believing that everyone should be the same gender and sex. We should just not, we should just not call anyone anything. Let's call everyone a they. Let's call everyone a random fucking pronoun, which it makes no sense. Like they is plural. Do you have multiple personalities? They is not always plural, Angela. She's educated, she knows better than this. This is the reason why I don't agree with Black Lives Matters because that organization does not stand for black lives. The only thing that organization does is create rioting and violence and incite hatred and division. The only thing that Black Lives Matters does, and you can bring, you, if you don't like this, I don't care. They create violence and they, they create more harm, more division in the black community. And that to me is atrocious. It's atrocious that they have the audacity to say black lives matters and they don't do a damn thing to actually assist black lives. Did you know that Planned Parenthood, I mean, this is all interrelated. Planned Parenthood was created. Now I love Planned Parenthood. They saved my life. Okay. But I am a rare example of Planned Parenthood's good. Do your research. Planned Parenthood was created to eradicate, eradicate black lives. Like 90% of the abortions that they perform are on black women. Planned Parenthood goal, eradicate black lives. Black Lives Matters goal, incite violence and writing and murders. Those two organizations are very closely tied. So if you do not understand what is the underlying agenda of those organizations, it's essentially white supremacy. 
In 2013, Planned Parenthood actually released their demographic information and revealed that only 14% of their patients were black, which is pretty close to being on par with the proportion of black people in the United States population. This information is so easy to find, yet here she is spreading this rhetoric that is the root cause of the loss of women's bodily rights to their own autonomy. You can't be pro-woman while actively stripping their rights away like this, Angela. She publicly came out as the first Republican witch in September of 2020. I've had a lot of people tell me that you can't be a witch and be a conservative, and that is wildly untrue. I used to be a liberal witch, and now I'm a conservative witch, but I'm still a witch. Do you want to know what a witch is? A witch is a woman who is innately connected to the natural and elemental cycles of being a woman. I have to say, Angela is a prime example of how so many people in America went so far off the right wing deep end during COVID. I don't know if her age played a factor at this point, maybe it was the resurfacing of her upbringing in indoctrination, as she put it, her words, not mine, having been raised Southern Baptist. There might be a lot of factors at play for why she and so many others made such a harsh turn that year. Personally, I think it was the way COVID got politicized by news outlets. I think that played a really big role in it. And Angela has always been all about her own personal freedoms as a woman, being able to behave however she wanted to. It's only natural that once the patriarchy started telling her that she needed to adhere to these new guidelines, that she decided to rebel. And then she naturally fell down the rabbit hole of the side of politics that claims to be the side of freedom. I mean, it really is something, isn't it? Her entire platform has been glorified womanhood. And Angela, who up until this point identified as a witch who hated the church, has had her life literally saved by Planned Parenthood. She has posted pictures of her wearing her period blood as war paint. She says she stands for women, but here she is having the nerve to spread the narrative that is actively dismantling all forms of feminism just to preserve their fragile masculinity. While I don't agree with everything that she used to stand for, for. I loved her message behind like the power of a woman that she used to have. The whole like power and beauty and all those things. I, I loved that. Now she's just an empty shell of a hypocrite. And then, obviously, money. The top 1% usually falls on the right side of politics because they get to hoard more money through Republican administrations. Again, I think a lot of factors played into it, but she got bought. The price was right for her, plain and simple. Just to follow up on previous Angela lore, in November 2020, she got a traditional South American cleansing ritual done called Combo, which is basically when you apply the poisonous secretions of the giant monkey frog onto your open wounds, which are what these circular marks are. For the record, experts say that there's no scientific evidence to say that it does anything it's supposed to do and in fact links it to causing toxic hepatitis organ failure, and even death in extreme cases, so this is me basically telling you not to do it, but anyway, I bring it up because Angela decides to completely erase Cherie and her traumatic passing and says that she cut off all of her hair three years prior because she heard the calling of the frog. I shaved my head off, my hair off. I had waist length hair and I shaved it off after I heard the call of the frog. and. As soon as I heard that call of the frog, I began this waking up. The passive, sweet, good little girl uh, said, basically, fuck that. I will not live that way. I am going to choose to be aggressive. Yeah, great job memorializing the death of someone that you claim to love so deeply. As the months went on, Angela began hoarding more and more wealth for herself while still remaining homeless by choice, only now she had a brand new Mercedes Benz that she's seen showing off here. And don't worry, the anger inside of this woman only continued to build up. This video is wild, I'm not gonna preface it any more than that, just watch. Are people this fucking stupid. I, I, my period's coming. I'm pissed. And I need to know, I need to know if people are this fucking stupid. Are they this stupid? Or are they, are they like, do they believe it? Which then if they believe it, 
given all the evidence to the contrary, using their critical thinking skills and their ability to see with their eyeballs and their third eye and their higher self, are people this fucking stupid? I feel like I'm going to throw up. I'm so mad about how stupid people are. First of all, I make a reservation. I tell the person over the phone, I have a medical exemption, so please note that when I arrive. I will not be wearing a mask and I will have my service dog with me. I would like a table in the corner on the patio. Crystal clear. I couldn't have been more clear. I get there and the hostess is like, (gasps) 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 where's the mask? (gasps) I'm like, are you having a reaction to your injection? Or have you suffocated yourself for a year and you can't think because you have no oxygen? She begins to like convulse because she can see my queen face. You would have thought I showed her my apple or my bloody, bloody, bloody. Oh, I'm mad. Oh, I'm pissed. My Aries descendant, the witch of so many lifetimes, I'm fucking pissed. I'm so angry at women succumbing to this. You are in charge of your partner. You are in charge of your babies. You are in charge of this earth. Shame on the women who are buying into this fucking bullshit agenda. I hope you can see my spit. I'm so fucking pissed. Click, 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 click. Literally, I think people are brain damaged. I think people are brain damaged. Why is no one questioning this? They have no idea what they're treating unless they created it. Hmm. Huh. Oh, imagine that. I'm looking at these women covering their face. Their babies are a I'm just disgusted by women right now. I just want to spit on them. I just want to spit on women, especially mothers who are wearing masks and getting this injection, experimenting on their own bodies, shedding these lab created proteins on their babies and other women. You should be disgusted with yourself. You should be fucking disgusted with yourself. I don't care how many clients I lose. I don't care. I, I lost so many clients when I started speaking out about what's going on. Don't care. Don't care. I came to fucking fight. I'm so angry at the women who are just rolling over and letting themselves be ripped by the government, ripped by the man, ripped by one another. It's disgusting. Take your fucking mask off and put your crown on. Anyone who's telling you you need to do something, tell them to go fucking mind their own fucking business and go sit on their fucking middle finger. Sitting on your middle finger would be a much funner experience, experience and experiment than the, I can't, I can't handle these women. It's disgusting. You're like caving in. You start getting those inoculations, you're theirs. They own you. They own you. They can watch everywhere you go. They know everything you do. Sick. I had a client tell me, well, I can't go see any of my friends or family if I don't get. Well, they go tell them to fuck themselves. If they choose not to see you because you're not, you're not going to experiment on your own body. That's not your problem. In fact, if you get this, you're not welcome near me. You're not going to shed that nasty ass protein all over me. You're not going to interrupt my natural state of queendom. 
You're not going to put your sheepishness on me. First of all, Angela, I think you and I both know that you don't have a medical exemption from wearing a mask. You're just rebelling. Secondly, this kind of behavior is not normal or healthy. Not that Angela would ever label herself as normal, <laughs> but she even admits here that she has been so problematic throughout the pandemic that she lost her clients, like half of her clients. They were dropping like flies. And then suddenly she's not rolling in the dough that she was before. But that did not stop her from continuing to rage. I am enraged at the people who have willingly turned their bodies over to be experimental research. And rage. Someone asked me if I'd gotten the vaccine and I asked them if they liked anal sex. And they just looked at me and I was like, well, you're asking me about something that's personal and private. And so I just figured I could ask you about something that's personal and private. And rage. When I started making money, I started to re-examine my political opinions. And then I started looking at the transgender agenda and all these movements um, that the left perpetuates and um, fuels. And I don't agree with those agendas at all. Until she made the inevitable decision to join a multi-level marketing company. Okay guys, after everything we've uncovered in this video about Angela's journey, here's my opinion on why she inevitably decided to join Monet. She spent a year and a half getting progressively more and more right-wing QAnon nut jobby. <laughs> that over time she chased away a huge chunk of her clientele and then by extension of course her money we talk about mlms a lot here and we've seen time and time again how a huge majority of mlm distributors fall into that category of right-wing conservatives many of them are extremists and they push the QAnon belief system this was angela's only next logical step she needed to find people who would continue to pay her while she continues to go on her right-wing Rants, and where else better to find people who will listen to that shit and also pay you than in an MLM? But yeah, hi, if you're new, uh, welcome. We talk about MLMs all the time. Monate, which is short for Modern Nature, is a multi-level marketing company that started off selling shampoo, but it has evolved to offer skincare and supplements. And by the way, if you didn't know, MLMs are essentially pyramid schemes. The compensation model in these companies is basically like the more people you recruit underneath you, the more money you make. And you make a bulk of your money off of your downlines purchases instead of from actual retail sales. Money from the bottom 99% flows up to the top 1%, leaving a large majority of the company's distributors in worse financial shape than they were when they started. With Monate specifically, the biggest criticism of the products is that it's been linked to making people's hair fall out. Lawsuits have been filed against the company for this, some of which were consolidated into one mega class action lawsuit. Some are ongoing even to this day. And since they operate out of Florida, they had to enter into an assurance of voluntary compliance with the Florida Attorney General, requiring that the claims made by their representatives are accurate and not misleading, which hasn't been complied to at all, but the agreement still stands. The FDA also inspected Monate's facilities and found, and I quote from lawyerinc.com, the presence of harsh chemicals in their products and contamination in the manufacturing process. Despite all of this, Monet and its representatives maintain that they are unfairly under attack and they are not guilty of any of the things that these public government entities have claimed. Angela certainly embodied a right-wing MLM distributor, going so far as to use Donald Trump sound bites to sell her stupid shampoo. I said, let me take it. And it was incredible the way it worked, incredible. And when I say that her entire identity became Monate, I am not joking. I'm not gonna bore you with all of her social media posts from this time, but just know that it was real after real after real of her trying to recruit people to sell Monate with her. It's also interesting to note here that she found God again during her time with Monate. Yeah, so she used to hate the church. She only believed in magic and other realms and dimensions and aliens and stuff. And then the moment she joins Monet, she's like, oh, I love Jesus now. I mean, it's par for the course, so we can't be surprised by this. But for someone who's always talking about how she won't conform to anyone or anything, she sure conformed to Monet's culture pretty damn fast. 
she starts to break down her beliefs in this life. And while I actually resonate with her feelings about the church and the patriarchy, so much of this is literally conforming to the beliefs of the people around her. And it's really unfortunate to see. When I started to teach magic and work with magic, I felt very disconnected from any sort of creator. And that comes from many traumas, including in this lifetime, the trauma of being born into a patriar patriarchal, indoctrinated system of the church. When I'm talking about God, I'm not talking about the church. <laughs> when I'm talking about what I believe in now and moving forward, it is not the church. The church is perverse in so many ways. The people who teach the teachings of, of Jesus and the word of God is so perverse and backwards. So I pulled away from the church in this lifetime. And then in other lifetimes, which I'm not really gonna get into today, in other lifetimes, I had been um, persecuted by the church, burned at the stake, slaughtered, harmed in so many ways by people who were acting on behalf of man and of God. And naturally, as a very intuitive being, as someone who could see and speak to the other realms, dead people, aliens, etc., I wanted nothing to do with the church because the church told me that I was wrong and bad for being able to have these abilities. All women have these powers. All women have these capabilities. I gave all my money to a teacher. <laughs> I became homeless and I became this witch that lived in the woods. I was just in nature, <laughs> totally living in sync with what it means to be a witch, a woman who is innately, distinctly, and irrevocably connected to nature. So that is what a witch is. Enter God. So when all the witches started coming onto Instagram, peddling all of this stuff that is just not true, and it is not of the natural world, it is not the world that God created, when I started seeing that a couple of years ago with the election and the planned situation in the world, when I started seeing all these witches peddling this darkness and coming after and attacking us true women who are here to connect women to their natural place as bleeders and creators and mothers and awakeners and transmute transmuters mutationers y'all in one fell swoop when i started calling out this fraudulent behavior i lost half of my clients i lost half a million dollars at that point god had already been asking me questions <laughs> i never worked with god i worked with my ancestors I know how to contact my grandmothers. I know how to contact my guides. I know how to contact the angels, but I didn't contact God. I wasn't in contact with God. And I felt in my meditations, I felt God like very clearly saying, um, your meditations will change. They will become prayers and you will begin to do your work in a new way. I had also just found Monate. Through Monate, I found women who were deeply devoted to God and women that I could never have met otherwise. And I felt very clearly led to Monate. Very, very clearly, God was like, here. I have been, for the last year, trying to make sense of how being a witch and God fit together. And I'm not here to tell you that I have the answers. I'm not here to tell you that there is a one size fits all answer. I mean, the greatest thing that's ever happened to me in this lifetime is God reentering. As a quick aside, as I was finishing up the research in this video, Angela admits that she's falling down the flat earth rabbit hole and says that her favorite Bible verse is one that all the flat earthers use to suggest that earth is covered by a glass ceiling. She also shared this 10 minute long TikTok about some girl saying that the earth is flat and then cites the Bible to prove it, 
you can't make this shit up. Just two months after joining Monday, she made a new Instagram account so she could exclusively sell her shitty shampoo over there. That account is now disabled. So there's a content gap for a couple months here, but never fear. She returned back to this account to pick up where she left off. And within the two months that she was on the other Instagram account, she became number one in the company globally. In the caption of this post, she said she made it to number one because she worked for it. But the statement is extremely misleading. Angela had already spent years building an Instagram following of over 10,000 people at this time. She had people eating out of the palm of her hand. They were buying into every single one of the courses that she released. She already had established a loyal cult-like following before joining Monet. She did not begin at the same starting point as everyone else. Her years of coaching people leading up to September of 2021, I believe contributed heavily to her quick success in Monet. The audacity of her to be like, I worked my Monet biz so hard and that's why I'm so successful. No, it's not. <laughs> You don't just like turn into number one in the company with nothing coming before that. It doesn't work that way, just no. And the point of her saying this is literally to be like, hey, look, I joined this MLM and became financially free so fast. Join me and you can do it too. No, you can't. Do you have a cult-like following of 10,000 people? No, okay, then you won't see this kind of success. She's manipulating and misleading you. Anyway, suddenly science is wonderful now. As long as it's the kind of science that she likes, right? Monet studies are funded, wait for it, by Monet. They're biased, some of them weren't even done on a human scalp. But sure, okay, this is the science that Angela loves, gotcha. So she hits number one in the company and starts winning all these awards. And this is when she decides to quit coaching for good, quote unquote, and just focus on Monet. And she does so by claiming that Monet made her wrinkles disappear while hiding behind heavy filters in every single one of her reels. She posted a five and a half month before and after and I gotta say, girl, get a trim. Your ends are screaming. Her hair really doesn't look that great after nearly half of an entire year using this stuff. Which, by the way, let's talk about Angela's routine. The caption on this video says that her hair care routine before Monet was apple cider vinegar and coconut oil, no shampoo. Dude, Angela, and anyone who needs to hear this, if you go from using that to any actual products made for human hair, you're gonna see a difference. You could have spent 10 bucks on Suave's cheapest shampoo and conditioner and styling products line, and your results would have still been night and day. But instead, no, go spend hundreds of dollars on Monet. Pretty easy to contribute that kind of result to something you spent hundreds of dollars on. But it's not that you switched to Monet, it's that you switched to a product that was made for hair. <laughs> like, oh my God, I know that she is not this naive. As wild as Angela is, she is intelligent deep down in there. Like she knows she's full of shit here. One common selling point that Monet distributors like to utilize are these kind of before and after pictures. Here's the thing though, the moment that these people start making an income from having good looking hair, then they develop an actual hair care routine that they never had before. They've probably never styled it. Now suddenly they're blow drying it or otherwise styling it every day because newsflash, there's an incentive for them to do that now. They could have done this all along without Monet products. They could have picked any line of products and they could have used those products to achieve better looking hair, but they never cared to do that before there was an incentive to make money. It's not Monet, guys. It's the establishment of a routine. And in Angela's case, it's switching from freaking apple cider vinegar to actual shampoo. I'm saying this as someone who used Monet and experienced it for myself for eight months. And trust me, it's nothing special. She even made a very special how to wash your hair correctly video, which if you need instructions on how to use a shampoo, that's some extra ass shit. It's shampoo. In this video alone, Angela uses the following products. First, their scalp purifying scrub, which retails for $61. Second, she shampoos twice. Most Monate shampoos retail for $45. Some are more, but let's just say this product is $45 just to be nice. 
After that, she uses their Advanced Hydrating in Shower Mask, which retails for $64. She does conditioner, which seems to retail for around $57. Altogether, if you want to wash your hair properly, according to Monet, you need to fork up $227. $227 to wash your hair. That is stupid. This is stupid. Everything is stupid. Do you see why us anti-MLMers spend so much of our energy on proving that Monet is a scam? Because once you sign up for Monet, if you just buy the $99 starter kit, you have to go out and buy all those products anyway. And I say have to because you need to be a product of the product. If you're not, no one's going to want to buy all that shampoo from you unless you have something to show for it. And by the way, even if you buy the most expensive starter kit at $649, it doesn't even include that scalp purifying scrub. So you'd still need to pay Monet even more money to buy that product. When we say that distributors are the customers, this is what we're talking about here. A majority of the sales that Monet makes comes from distributors, not outside retail sales. And we know this as a fact because last year, fellow YouTuber Cece Suarez posted a video exposing some financial documents that she got her hands on fairly, by the way. Monet didn't lock it up away from the public, so that's why Chelsea was able to find them and see them. But Monet sent her a cease and desist letter, so she took the video down, so I can't direct you to it. But just know, we've seen the documents. The documents exist. The numbers do not look good in Monet's favor when it comes to retail sales versus distributor purchases. Angela doesn't hide the fact that she makes a metric butt ton of money with Monet, but she would never admit that a large majority came from her team and how much that they were buying personally. And then I saw the paychecks. I want you to know something. We get paid every Friday and on the 15th. I cannot believe how much money I've made. But in this video, she says you don't have to have a huge following. Easy for you to say, Angela, you had thousands of loyal supporters before you joined. Speak for yourself. During her Monet era, she also claims that she's shadow banned a lot, and she knows this because she only gets 300 to 500 story views. Could it be because maybe once you sold your soul to Monet, people didn't want to hear your shit anymore? I mean, at least Angela before Monet was engaging and interesting. Now you're just a pyramid scheme shill and you're shocked that people don't care about your content anymore? But yeah, girl, no, you're totally just shadow banned, please. Now for the moment that truly put Angela on the anti-MLM radar, her famous Holocaust rant. I've made the decision that I'm not ever putting a face diaper on ever again, for any reason, ever again, period. And I've made that decision because I truly believe that what has happened over the last two years is the biggest crimes against humanity that humans have ever seen. Now you might be like, what about the Holocaust? Um, and I think this is worse. What they've managed to do over the last two years is brainwash the entire world into believing that a lab created thing is jumping around and triple, you know, face diapers, rubber gloves, like people think that they're going to just drop dead when there's a 99.9% .9 survival rate, unless you're obese or have other um, comorbidities, right? Because obesity is the issue. The issue is not getting sick. The issue is that you're fat and you're inflamed and your body can't fight off illness. Like you wouldn't have lived in the Oregon Trail. You wouldn't have survived. This video got passed around all corners of the internet and it was at this point where we all collectively started covering her because she was a gold mine of content. And obviously based on the video you just watched, we weren't just covering her because she's some cringy shampoo babe, but her opinions were dog shit. During this time, she picked up so much attention that she was featured on the Young Turks social media pages, so she was getting a lot of exposure, just not the kind that any MLMer wants. After 10 months of making her entire social media presence about Monet, she decided to get back into coaching. It's almost as if her income started dwindling along with everyone else in Monet, huh? One thing you need to understand about MLMs in the COVID times is that in the early days, MLMs were booming because so many people got laid off and they weren't working and they needed to find a way to make up for that lost income. 
and they bought into the entirely false promises that MLMs are regularly making to convince you to join. Time freedom, financial freedom, be your own boss, work from your phone, be there for your kids, blah, 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 all that bullshit. But then I would say that probably around like mid 2021, there was a mass exodus. MLMs began to scramble to make up for all those people who were leaving. And why were they all leaving? Because they had just spent months in a pyramid scheme and then they realized it was all bullshit and all of those people who bought in during the pandemic started to wake up and they realized that they were in a worse financial spot than they were before they joined. So then they just quit. <laughs> The timing kind of does add up with Angela getting back into coaching. She shoots up to the top of an MLM super quick by recruiting all of her loyal supporters. And then after 10 months, a majority of them quit because it's bullshit. And suddenly she needs more money again. I haven't seen her numbers personally, so I don't know. I'm just guessing. But I'm usually a pretty good guesser when it comes to MLM shenanigans. Further evidence of this point is this video in October of 2022 where she talks about Ernie Monate's incentive trip to the Bahamas, but then also says that no one else on her team qualified. I was feeling like I really wanted to go home after the work portion with Monate. Just like feeling kind of lonely and like my team isn't here and everyone is with their teams and everyone's like hanging out with their teams and I didn't have anyone that qualified for this trip and I'm not close with like my uplines so I've been kind of alone and I just I just wanted to go home so if you're such a great mentor and teacher and whatever if being on your team equals a high likelihood of success if you are number one in the company how is it that no one is there with you it literally sounds to me like she recruited a ton of people at once, AKA people who were already followers of hers. So she won all those awards and qualified for the trip, but then none of them succeeded because it's almost impossible to become successful in any MLM. So she basically recruited a team big enough to qualify her for an incentive trip, and then everyone started quitting. That's what I think happened. And then, as if the world hadn't already had enough of Angela's shenanigans, she got pregnant. I don't think most of us knew about her previous infertility struggles. We were all just kind of like, oh great, that anti-vax QAnon witch who smears period blood on her face is going to be in charge of another human life. Wonderful. And a lot of the criticism she got during this time was that she refused any prenatal care at all. No ultrasounds, no pelvic exams, nothing. I even personally remember her saying that she was going to give birth in the middle of the forest by herself at one point, which she didn't end up doing, but still. And I am all for the natural route of childbirth, but in my opinion, you need to have a medical professional standing by. Like, it's not a secret that birth can go wrong in the blink of an eye. In 2021, the maternal mortality rate was 32.9 deaths per 100,000 births, equaling 1,205 people, which was up from 23.8 in 2020, and that was up from 20.1 in 2019. Now, a majority of these deaths occurred in people of advanced maternal age or over the age of 40. At the time of the birth, I think Angela was 38, so not quite 40, but pretty damn close. It was all of our opinions that Angela was being irresponsible, not only with the personal health choices that could have affected her and her baby, but also for spewing her dangerous antics all over social media. So her first post about the pregnancy was in June 2022, and then this Instagram account went silent until October, when she decided to start coaching again. And she didn't shy away from her feelings about prenatal care, saying things like, Not one scan is helpful. It's actually harmful to mama and baby. No prenatal vitamin gives you nutrients. It's all toxic trash. No medical provider needs to fear you. Let's call it what it is. A no advice is necessary. Women have always given birth since forever. Return to your natural state, woman. You don't need permission. And it's not too late to say no more. I don't think you guys need me to say this, but don't listen to a damn thing that Angela says. Seek prenatal care, listen to your doctor, because if Angela had done that, she probably would have avoided the medical emergency that she ended up having after giving birth. Yeah, she went to the emergency room. So given how Angela has nearly died twice, 
due to loss of blood while miscarrying, having an unassisted home birth is probably the stupidest thing that she could have done in my opinion. While on her Instagram page, she was telling everyone how perfect and wonderful her birth went, behind the scenes, things weren't as great. Someone leaked these Telegram DMs from a chat called Baby Shower for Angela Sumner, where Angela sends the message, losing too much blood, I decided to come in just to get checked. And while the chat exploded with tots and pears, Angela updated everyone by saying, low blood pressure and hemoglobin. I was feeling lightheaded and couldn't catch my breath. Tingly limbs and cold sweats. Bed rest and I've gotta take it easier than I have been, which I thought was very easy. I'm glad I came. I won't be checking in here for the next week or so while I rest. Thank you all for your love. Despite this, Angela went on her Instagram a few days later to answer questions about her birth. Here are some of the more notable questions and answers. How much equipment did you need to buy to prep for free birth? Checklist? You literally need nothing except towels. I had a history of hemorrhage, having hemorrhaged twice before after miscarriage slash abortion. So I bought precautionary herbs and homeopathy, which may have saved my life. Oh my God, Angela, the doctors in the emergency room saved your life, not your stupid plant bullshit. Anyway, she continues. I will tell you the whole story one day, but most women are not at risk. Home birth is the safest by far. All the hospital stats are, well, hospital stats based on women birthing in a completely unnatural environment. I wouldn't change one thing about my birth. Well, maybe one thing. Okay, so I required oxygen during the birth of both of my kids. Mine and their heart rates and oxygen sats and stuff, they were all dropping. And with my son, I had an 11 minute long contraction and almost lost consciousness, so. I made it to about seven centimeters before there was medical intervention. But thankfully by then, like I was already at the hospital so that they could intervene. And I love my OB. I'm grateful for the doctors and the nurses that were there to get me through that wild, 11 minute contraction ride. What Angela is doing here is so beyond dangerous, it's disgusting. In this slide, Angela shares that when she went to the hospital, she wouldn't let them touch her baby. She says, I know best. That's why I went to the hospital. But if you know best, then that means that your knowledge is superior to that of a doctor, so why did you feel the need to consult one? In another slide, she says she refused pharmaceuticals and just ate her placenta raw instead. So like, what was the point of going if this is the truth? Make it make sense. I think we all know the truth is that Angela didn't actually have all of the answers and needed life-saving intervention from actual professionals, but she's trying to save face here. But to those of us who can utilize logic and reason within our stupid little brains, we can see that things aren't adding up. All I'm hearing is, I know best, so I went to see the people who know best because I know best. What? <laughs> She also shared that she had a hemorrhoid that she pushed back into her own butthole, so that's totally cool and safe. And at one point, she literally compares her baby to a turd, saying that she didn't have to push once. Her baby just came out like a turd does. I went into it with zero expectations, except that obviously my baby would come out. Imagine sitting down to poop with any expectation except that your poop would come out, right? Imagine being like, Oh my god, I wonder how long it will take. Or if I'll need to be cut because the poop is too big. Or I wonder if the poop will get stuck. Or I wonder if the poop comes out backwards. It's so ridiculous. The baby has to come out. I think a major issue in the birth world is too much education. It's simple. The baby comes out. Your body knows how to get the baby out. It isn't rocket science. Oh my god, imagine thinking that too much education is a bad thing. Unless your poop is Mr. Hanky the Christmas Poo. <laughs> then your poop does not have a head. Your poop does not have a neck that can get broken or irreversibly harmed if it gets stuck. It doesn't have legs that can get stuck and potentially get hurt or broken. Poop is not a fragile human life, but that baby coming out of your body can get hurt and it can be harmed. You can't compare a human baby to a turd, Angela. That's disrespectful. She also had the nerve here to say that you cannot evolve as a woman until you have a kid. So what about women who were never able to have kids, Angela? She almost went her whole life without a kid despite several attempts. 
A statement like this is so odd and inconsiderate coming from someone who has been through the struggles that she has with infertility. More wild shit she says, like saying that postpartum depression comes from the pharmaceuticals given in the hospital. Oh my god, it is the body's reaction to sudden shifts in hormones, Angela, and also body dysmorphia. I had it really bad with my second child, where you just feel like you look in the mirror and like your reflection is not what you feel like it should be. You feel like your body isn't yours. You get stretch marks, you gain weight, you look different and surprise, surprise, that can cause a lot of distress. All of that is natural, dude. You love natural shit, Angela, you should know this. She also made this anti-abortion post after the birth of her kid, questioning why anyone is fighting for the right to kill their children, despite the fact that Angela has had two abortions to save her life. That's straight hypocrisy, and she should know better than anyone why we fight so hard for abortion rights. At this point, she's grifting, like she would be dead without abortion, period. She also demonized putting your baby in a crib to sleep and strollers. Like, I'll be wearing my baby for the first several months. I'm not putting my baby in a stroller. I think that is wrong. Like, these are my personal opinions. Um, I think that's wrong. You can't, like, have a baby living inside of you for almost 10 months and all of a sudden just, like, put it down and be like, oh, you're good on your own. Like, here, go lay in this crib. <laughs> I'm sorry. No. My baby will be sleeping directly beside me at all times. Like, I will not be away from my child. So I co-slept with both of my kids. It was easier. I got better sleep that way. But I would never, and I'm telling you right now, don't do this. I would never advise another mother to do it. It is dangerous. It's like a do as I say, not as I do kind of thing here. I don't recommend it. Co-sleeping statistically leads to higher incidence in SIDS. And I told myself I would never co-sleep, but that just wasn't my reality. After having my daughter, I swore I'd never do it with my son. And again, it still didn't work for me the second time. So I will not shame Angela for admitting that she co-sleeps because I get it. But again, I will never tell another parent to do that. It's dangerous, period. And then the stroke thing what the hell dude babies love strollers my son is two and a half and he still gets excited when there's a potential to go on a stroller ride baby carriers are great i mean there's a few things about them that when they're really little and they can't hold their heads up that there's like suffocation risks that has actually happened but in general they're great okay and uh baby strollers are also great also oh look here's a picture of angela's baby in a stroller once her baby was five or six weeks old, she started using her new single motherhood to not only recruit struggling mothers into Monet, but also to sell rejuvenique oil to use on their babies. And in case you didn't know, rejuvenique is like $100 a bottle. And it's bullshit. It's just like a bunch of essential oils. So it's probably not the safest thing to be rubbing on your baby's head. And then in this video, just a few weeks later, you can see her baby's hair is falling out, which for the record is totally normal. My daughter had a grandpa haircut, as we called it, which kind of looks like what's going on with Angela's baby. It's normal, just like postpartum hair loss in mothers. But I guess the rejuvenique wasn't helping, huh? She also started sharing QAnon conspiracies again, like claiming that 1,200 children get stolen every day in the United States. This particular claim on Angela's video seems to have stemmed from people like Lauren Boebert, who in 2020 claimed that 365,348 children mysteriously vanished that year and that the media was refusing to report on it. Guys, the truth is that 99% of those cases were resolved quickly. The number that Lauren Boebert gave and that Angela is basically giving here, that is the number of missing children reports made. But a vast majority of them were things like they were runaways or they returned home shortly after the missing persons report was filed. The reality is that out of the over 365,000 missing children reports that were made in 2020, only 79 of them were actual abductions. Which obviously 79 is 79 too many, but it's not some secret human trafficking ring that these right-wing QAnon nutjobs like to spread around. Think logically for one second. If 365,000 children were vanishing without a trace in this country every single year, it would be widely covered. It would be a huge problem. We'd be in an emergency lockdown situation. It would literally be hide your kids, hide your wife, but especially hide your kids. There would be no more children in our country after like a decade. There, there just 
they wouldn't exist anymore. There would be no more children. In a very short amount of time, they would all be gone. So I can't say that the abduction of children is a non-issue because obviously it is. I can't say that human trafficking doesn't happen because obviously it does. It's just utilized as a political device, which is ridiculous. So what is Angela doing today, you may ask? Well, she's offering virtual doula services. Ugh. Okay, yeah. For three months of postpartum support, you'll pay her $1,100. Third trimester and postpartum support is $1,500. And for your entire pregnancy and postpartum support, it's $2,200. It just seems to me like another way for Angela to convince naive women into endangering the lives of themselves and their babies by refusing any prenatal birth or postnatal attention. This is stupid for Angela. Like, she could legitimately hurt someone here. She says she won't accept clients who plan on returning to work for the three months after the baby is born. So basically, she'll only take rich women or women with rich baby daddies. Cute. She also demonizes formula feeding and then in the same slide admits that she needed to supplement with formula. And while I can attest to the absolute joy that I experienced breastfeeding my two children, and after my son was born, I actually had to work to get him to breastfeed because he was a NICU baby. So while he was there, it was only for a few days, but he got used to drinking out of a bottle. So when he got home, it took like a few weeks of me like training him to breastfeed. Like I love it. I'm a huge proponent of it. I miss it most days. I stopped breastfeeding a year ago and I still want to cry thinking about not doing it anymore. <laughs> I get that, but how dare you try to demonize a parent for how they want to feed their child. Breastfeeding is hard. It's super painful for the first few weeks. Getting your body to the point where it doesn't hurt anymore, very difficult. Crying every time that they try to latch, like it, no, no, <laughs> it hurts. And then pumping. Yeah, don't even get me started on pumping. It is a time sucking annoyance and it is absolutely okay if a parent decides that they don't want to go through all that and just because like I exclusively breastfed my son for 18 months and it was beautiful and wonderful and magical like just because I had that experience doesn't mean that I'm gonna like sit here and try to tell a mom that I'm not gonna support her if she decides not to breastfeed in the same sequence of stories she posts this slide that literally just says look at teenagers y'all look at adults look at men Look at the trans agenda. Angela, what does any of that have to do with anything? She admits that she basically has no credentials because every birthing program she looked into wasn't trans exclusionary, so she didn't trust any of them. The inner turf is shining bright with this one. Angela basically says she has an Indian doula immersion experience. She read a book and then she gave birth herself, so clearly that qualifies her to be a doula for people. She also says to her, a doula is a friend with authority to tell you what's up. Basically, she's selling her friendship. As far as her involvement in Monet, a little over a month ago, Angela shared this post to her story. Someone asked her if she'd do Monet forever and she answered, right now, I can't imagine leaving because one, there's no better way to make money as a single mama and two, I love my team and I want to see them hit all their goals. Well, Angela hasn't really posted anything about Monet for the past month. Instead, she's been posting about something you may have heard about from other anti-MLMers talking about it, but it's called master resale rights. Now, I have a video diving into one company doing this called Infinity Processing Systems, which is is a video of mine that regularly gets scammers commenting about how well it's worked for them, which is absolute bullshit, but it's cute that they try. Anyway, Angela says that she's still working with Mane, even though her social media doesn't reflect that but apparently she needed to supplement her income from Monet. Must not be paying like it used to, huh? Long story short, master resale rights works like this. So a company will make a course about making money online, basically. They sell it for $500 and then people go buy that course from the company. And when they buy the course, they also receive the rights to resell that course to other people for $500, literally a 100% profit. So Angela likely gave this whatever the parent company is, $500. And now she's going on and selling that course to other people for $500. And then they get to take the course and sell it to their friends and family for $500 and so on and so forth. The weird thing is, is that the people who sell these courses, no matter which master resale right company it's with, they never actually give like an inside look of what the course actually is and what's actually being taught in them. I'm 
not even convinced there is a course half the time. All they do is use vague language. They'll say like, you'll learn how to run your online business and how to automate an email list or something like that. But we never actually get like a sample of what any of the training materials are. Like, are they videos? Do we have one teacher? Are they multiple teachers? Is there homework? Is it like, what is it? <laughs> In my opinion, it's a quick cash grab, not only by the people who made the course, who are selling it to people to then resell. It's also a cash grab by people like Angela. The ridiculous thing to me is that Angela has been selling her own courses for years. Like she makes her own curriculum and training material and all those things. So now she's selling someone else's course? It's kind of misleading, don't you think? People who have been following Angela and taking her courses in the past are probably just looking at this like, yay, Angela's coaching again. Yay, woohoo, let's buy her course. Except she's not though. Like this isn't her course. She didn't make it. She doesn't teach it. It has nothing to do with her. Well guys, if you made it to the end of this video, thank you for being here. I really appreciate you sitting through all of that. I know it was a lot. Before we end here, don't forget, click my link down below or scan this QR code, however you want to do it. But for goodness sake, do yourself a favor and check out Endel. First hundred people get a week of it for free and I highly recommend it. It is fabulous. And now I just want to thank my patrons and my members. The list of people I'm about to name off here and that you see scrolling across the screen now are my financial supporters. They get access to things like a private discord server. We have a postcard club, all of that fun stuff. So if any of that sounds good to you, you can go to patreon.com slash Savannah Marie, or you can click the join button beneath this video to join my YouTube memberships. Whatever works for you works for me. I appreciate you guys supporting me here and supporting the things that I do. And with that, the biggest thank you in the whole wide world goes to Hula Chowdown, Jacqueline Nutton, Janelle Pratt, Elizabeth Wyatt, Kessie Drew, Nitty Dragon, Leanne, Sheila Tapia, Caroline Reed, Charlotte Treese, Daniel Urena, Maddie Darley, Ray, Turd Ferguson, Martine Hubert, and Amber Price, Baby Pink Pearl, Alice Wagner, Laura Jensen, Miss Blue, Carol Campbell, Ari, Amy Louise, Mira S.I.K., LaSalle Story, Mother Dragon 82, Fallon Lowry, Hannah, Carrie K., Love to Be Evil, The Best Elephant, Jessica Billhart, Emion, and Auntie Lou, and to the rest of my financial supporters, thank you so much for being here and for being you. And even if you're not a financial supporter, thank you for making it to the end of this video. YouTube loves watch time, so you being here is helpful in getting this video seen by more people and by extension, my channel. So thank you so much. Keep making waves, babes. I'll smell you all later. Mommy Tsunami out.